Book 14, Odysseus Meets Eumaeus. Odysseus left the harbor, taking the rough path into the woods and across the hills, to the place where Athena told him he would meet the swineherd, who was, of all the servants Lord Odysseus had, the one who took best care of his possessions. He found him sitting in the front part of his house, a built-up courtyard with a panoramic view, a large fine place with cleared land all around. The swineherd built it by himself to house the pigs, property belonging to his absent master. All of a sudden, the dogs observed Odysseus. They howled and ran at him, barking furiously. Odysseus was alert enough to drop his staff and sit. Still, he had had them severely mauled in his own farmyard, but the swineherd ran up fast behind them, dropping the leather in his hands. Charging to the gate and shouting at his dogs, he scattered them in a hail of stones here and there. Then he spoke out to his master. Old man, those dogs would have ripped at you in no time, and then you'd have heaped the blame on me, while I've got other troubles from the gods things to grieve about, for as I stay here raising fat pigs for other men to eat, I'm full of sorrow for my noble master, who's probably going hungry somewhere, as he wanders through the lands and cities where men speak a foreign tongue, if, in fact, he's still alive and looking at the sunlight. But follow me, old man. Come in the hut. When you've had enough to eat and drink and your heart's satisfied, you can tell me where you've come from, what troubles you've endured. With these words, the loyal swineherd went inside the hut, brought Odysseus in, and invited him to sit. Odysseus was glad to get this hospita hospitality, so he addressed him, saying, Stranger, may Zeus and other gods of the forever give you what you truly want. You welcome me with such an open heart. Then swineherd Eumaeus uh, answered him and said, It would be wrong, stranger, for me to disrespect a guest, even if one were one worse off than you arrive, for all guests and beggars come from Zeus. Summary, Eumaeus and Odysseus talk at length. Odysseus gives a long, false story about how he is from Crete and about how he reached Ithaca. End summary. As these two were talking like this to each other, the other herdsmen came in with their swine. They shut the, up, shut the sows up in their customary pens so they could sleep. The pigs gave out amazing squeals as they were herded in. Then the twisty swineherd called out to his companions, Bring a boar in here, the best there is, so I can butcher it for the stranger from another country. We too will get some benefit from it, seeing that we've worked hard for such a long time and gone through troubles, troubles for these white tusked pigs, while others gorge themselves on our hard work without paying anything. Once he'd said this, with his sharp bronze axe, he chopped up wood for kindling while others led in a fat, big fat boar, five years old, and stood him by the hearth. The swineherd's heart would sound. He did not forget the gods. So he began by throwing in the fire some bristles from the head of the white tusked boar and praying to all the gods that wise Odysseus would come back to his own home. So resourceful Odysseus spoke to him and said, Eumaeus, may Father Zeus treat you as well as you're treating me with this boar's chine, the very finest cut of meat, even though I'm just a beggar. Then swineherd Eumaeus replied by saying, Eat up God-guided stranger and enjoy the kind of food we offer. A god gives some things and holds others back, as his heart prompts, for he can do all things. Eumaeus spoke and offered two eternal gods the first pieces he had cut. He poured gleaming wine as a, as a libation, passed it over to Odysseus, sacker of cities, then sat to eat his portion. Night came on, bringing storms. There was no moon, and Zeus sent blustery west wind blowing in with rain. Eumaeus then jumped up and placed a bed for Odysseus near the fire. On the bed he threw some skins from sheep and goats. Odysseus lay down there. Eumaeus covered him with a thick, huge thick cloak, which he kept there as a change of clothing, something to wear whenever a great storm blew. So Odysseus went to sleep there, and the young men slept around him. But Eumaeus had no wish to have his bed inside and sleep so far away from all his boards, so he prepared to go outside. First, Eumaeus slung his sharp sword from his shoulder and wrapped a really thick cloak all around him to keep out the wind. Then he took a massive fleece from a well-fed goat and grabbed a pointed spear to fight off dogs and men. Then he left the hut, going to lie down and rest, where the white tusk boar slept beneath a hollow rock sheltered from north wind. Book 15. Telemachus Returns to Ithaca. Summary. Pallas Athena visits Telemachus in Sparta and tells him to return home and to visit the swineherd Eumaeus. In Ithaca, Odysseus and Eumaeus continue to talk about the situation in the royal palace. In summary. Meanwhile, Telemachus, summoned by Athena, had left Sparta for Pylos and set sail for home. As Telemachus's comrades were approaching land, they furled the sail and quickly lowered the mast. Then with their oars, they rowed into an anchorage, tossed out mooring stones, and lashed the cables at the stern. They themselves then disembarked in the crashing surf to prepare a meal and mix the gleaming wine. When they'd had food and drink to their heart's content, Prudent Telemachus was the first to speak. 
You men, row the black ship to the city while I check on the fields and herdsmen. I'll come to the city in the evening after I've looked over my estates. In the morning, I'll lay out a banquet as payment to you for the journey, a splendid meal of meat and sweetened wine. Telemachus trot, tied sturdy sandals on his feet, then from the deck picked out his powerful spear with a sharp bronze point. The crew untied stern cables and then pushed out to sea, sailing to the city as Telemachus, godlike Odysseus' dear son, had ordered them to do, while he strode quickly off, his feet carrying him onward until he reached the farmyard and the pigs in countless numbers, among whom the worthy swineherd lay asleep, always thinking gentle thoughts about his master. <coughs> Book 16 Odysseus Reveals Himself to Telemachus Meanwhile, at dawn, Odysseus and the loyal swineherd, once they had sent the herdsmen out with droves of pigs, made a fire in the hut and prepared their breakfast. As Telemachus came closer, the yelping dog stopped barking and fawned around him. Lord Odysseus noticed what the dogs were doing and heard his footsteps. At once he spoke up to Eumaeus. His words had wings. Eumaeus, some comrade of yours is coming, or someone else you know. The dogs aren't barking and aren't acting friendly. I hear footsteps. He'd hardly finished speaking when his own dear son stood in the doorway. The swine heard amazed, jumped up. The bowls he was using to mix the gleaming wine fell from his hands. He went up to greet his master, kissed his head, both his handsome eyes, his two hands. Then through his tears he spoke winged words to him. You've come, Telemachus, you sweet light. I thought I'd never see you any more. once you went off in that ship to Pelos. Come in now, dear boy, so that my heart can rejoice to see you here in my home, now that you just returned from distant places. Once he said this, he took Telemachus' brown spear and let him enter. He crossed the stone threshold. As he approached, as he approached Odysseus, his father got up to offer him his seat. But, but from across the room, Telemachus stopped him and said, Stay put, stranger. We'll find a chair in the hut somewhere else. Here's a man who'll get one for us. He spoke. Odysseus went back and sat down again. You may have piled up green brushwood on the floor and spread a fleece on top. Odysseus' dear son sat down there. The swineherd then set out before them platters of roast meat left over from the meal they had the day before, and quickly heaped up baskets full of bread. In a wooden bowl he mixed sweet wine as honey, and then sat down himself opposite God like Odysseus. Their hands reached out to the fine meal prepared and spread before them. When they've had food and drink to their heart's content, Telemachus then said to the splendid swineherd, O oh, friend, you must go quickly and report to wise Penelope that I've returned. I'm safely home from Pelos. I'll stay here until you've come give it, after you've given the news to her alone and come back here. The other Achaean must learn about it, for many of them are plotting nasty things against me. After you've delivered your message, then come back here. Don't go wandering around the fields looking for Laertes. Instead, tell my mother to send her maid, the housekeeper, quickly and in secret. She can report the news to the old man. His words spread on the swine herd. He took his sandals, tied them on his feet, and set off for the city. Now, it did not escape the notice of Athena that swineherd Eumaeus was going from the farm. She approached the hut, appearing like a woman, beautiful, tall, and skilled in making lovely things. She stood just outside the entrance of the farm and was visible to no one but Odysseus. Telemachus did not see her face to face or notice she was there. For, when gods appear, there's no way their form is perceptible to all. But Odysseus saw her. So did the dogs as well. But they didn't bark. Instead, they crept away, whimpering in fear, to the far side of the hut. She signaled with her eyebrows. Lord Odysseus noticed and went out of the hut, passed the large wall around the yard, and stood in front of her. Then Athena spoke to him. Son of Laertes, resourceful Odysseus, sprung from Zeus. Now is the time to speak to your own son. Make yourself known, and don't conceal the fact so you two can plan the suitor's lethal fate. Then go together to the famous city. I won't be absent from you very long. I'm eager for, eager for the battle. As she said this, Athena touched Odysseus with her golden wand. To start with, she placed a well-washed cloak around his body, then made him taller and restored his youthful looks. His skin grew dark once more, his countenance filled out, and the beard around his chin turned black again. Once she'd done this, Athena left, but Odysseus returned into the hut. His dear son was amazed. He turned his eyes away, afraid it was a god, and spoke to him. His words had wings. Stranger, you look different to me than you did before. You're wearing different clothes. Your skin has changed. You're one of the gods who hold wide heaven. If so, be gracious so we can give you pleasing offerings, well-crafted gifts of gold. But spare us. Long-suffering Lord Odysseus then answered him and said, I'm not one of the gods. Why do you compare me to a mortal? But I'm your father, on whose account you grieve and suffer so much trouble, having to endure men's acts of violence. Once he said this, he sat down and Telemachus embraced his noble father, cried out, and shed tears. A desire to lament arose in both of them. They wailed aloud, as insistently as birds, like sea eagles or hawks with curving talons, whose young had been carried off by country folk before they're fully fledged. 
That's how both men then let tears of pity fall from underneath their eyelids. And now light from the sun would have gone down on them as they wept. But Telemachus had not spoken. He suddenly addressed his father. And what kind of ship, dear father, did sailors bring you here to Ithaca? Who did they say they were? For I don't think you made it here on foot. Noble, long-suffering Odysseus answered him. All right, my child, I'll tell you the truth. Phaeacians, those famous sailors, brought me. They escort other men as well, all those who visit them. But come now, tell me about the number of the suitors, so I know how many men there are and what they're like. Then, once my noble heart has thought it over, I'll make up my mind whether we too are powerful enough to take them on alone, without assistance, or whether we should seek out other men. Shrewd Telemachus answered him and said, Father, I've always heard about your great renown, mighty warrior. Your hands are very strong. Your plan's intelligent. But what you say is far too big a task. I'm astonished. Two men cannot fight against so many, and they are powerful. In an exact amount, they are not just ten suitors, or twice ten, but many more. Here you can soon add up their numbers. From Dilichium, there are fifty-two hand-picked young men, six servants in their retinue. From Same, twenty-four. From Sazinthus, twenty young Achaeans. And from Ithaca itself, twelve young men, all nobility. Medon, the herald, is with them, as is the godlike minstrel, and two attendants skilled in carving meat. If we move against all these men inside, I fear revenge may bring a bitter fate now you've come home. So you should consider whether you can think of anyone who, who will help, someone prepared to stand by both of us and fight with all his heart. Then Lord Odysseus, who had endured so much, answered him and said, All right, I'll tell you. Pay attention now and listen. Do you believe Athena, along with Father Zeus, will be enough for the two of us, or should I think about someone else to help us? Shrewd Telemachus then said a reply. Those two allies you mentioned are excellent. They sit high in the clouds, ruling other, others, men and immortal gods. Long-suffering Lord Odysseus answered him and said, The two of them won't stand apart for long from the great fight. You can be sure of that. When Ares' warlike spirit in my halls is put to the test between these suitors and ourselves. But for now, when dawn arrives, go to the house. Join those arrogant suitors. The swineherd will bring me to the city later on. I'll be looking like a beggar, old and wretched. If they're abusive to me, let that dear heart in your chest endure it. While I am being tr badly treated, even if they drag me by my feet throughout the house and out the door or throw things and hit me. Keep looking on and hold yourself in check. I'll tell you something else. Keep it in mind. When wise Athena puts it in my mind, I'll nod my head to you. When you see that, take all the weapons of war lying there in the hall and put them in a secret place, all of them, in the lofty storage room. But leave behind a pair of swords two spears and two ox-hide shields for the two of us to grab up when we make a rush at them, while Pallas Athena and Counselor Zeus will keep the suitors' minds occupied. Preoccupied. I'll say something else. Keep it in mind. If you are my son and truly of our blood, let no one hear Odysseus is back home. Don't let Laertes know, or the swineherd, or any servants, or Penelope is herself. So the two men talked about these things together. Meanwhile, the well-built ship which brought Telemachus from Pylos with all his comrades had reached Ithaca. Once they had come inside the deep-water harbor, they hauled the black ship up on shore. Eager ser servants carried off their weapons and without delay took the splendid gifts to Clytius' house. They also sent a herald to Odysseus' house to report to wise Penelope, telling her Telemachus had gone to visit the estate and had told the ship to sail off for the city in case the noble queen might get sick at heart and shed some tears. This herald and the swineherd met because they both been sent off with the same report to tell the queen. When they reached the royal palace, the herald spoke up in front of female servants. My queen, your dear son, has just returned. But the swineherd came up close to Penelope and gave her all the details her dear son had ordered him to say. Once he told her every item he had been asked to mention to her, he went off, leaving the courtyard in the hall, back to his pigs. The suitors were unhappy, their hearts dismayed, and they, disp they departed from the hall, past the large courtyard wall. There, before the gates, they sat down. The first one of them to say something was Eurymachus, son of Pilibus. O oh, my friends, to tell the truth, in his great arrogance, Telemachus has carried out his trip, a great achievement. We never thought he would complete it. Now, so come on now. Let's launch a black ship, the best one we have, to collect some sailors, a crew of rowers, so they can quickly carry a report to those other men to go home at once. No sooner had he said all this than Anthinamus, turning in his grace, turning in his place, saw a ship in the deep harbor. Men were bringing down the sails, others holding oars. With a hearty laugh, he then addressed his comrades. Don't bother with the message anymore. Here they are back home. Either some god gave them news, or they saw his ship in themselves as it sailed past, but couldn't catch it. He spoke. They all got up and went to the sea shore, and quickly dragged the black ship up onto dry ground, 
while eager attendants carried off their weapons. They themselves went to the meeting place together. No one else was allowed to sit there with them, no old or younger man. Then Antinous addressed them, son of Epaphus. Well, this is bad news. The gods have delivered the man from harm. Our lookout sat each day on windy heights, always in successive shifts. At sunset, we never spent the night on shore, but sailed over the sea in our swift ship, waiting for sacred dawn, as we set our ambush for Telemachus, so we can capture and kill him. Meanwhile, some god has brought him home. So let's think about a sad end for Telemachus right here and ensure he doesn't stay, get away from us. For as long as he's alive, I don't think we'll be successful in what we're doing. He himself is clever, shrewd in counsel, and now people don't regard us well at all. So come now, before he calls the Keans to assembly. I don't think he will give up. He'll get angry and stand up to proclaim to everyone how we, we planned to kill him and how we didn't get him. The people resent us once they learn about our nasty acts. Take care they do not harm us and force us out away from our own land until we reach a foreign country. And so let's move first. Capture him out in the fields, far from the city, or else on the road. If what I've been saying displeases you and you prefer he should remain alive, retaining all the riches of his fathers, then let's not keep on gathering in this place, consuming his supply of pleasant things. Instead, instead let us, each man carry on his courtship from his own home, seeking to prevail with gifts. Then she can marry the one who offers most and comes to her as her destined husband. He finished. They all sat quiet, not saying a thing. Then Amphinomus spoke out and addressed them, splendid son of Lord Nisus. With good intentions, he spoke to them and said, My friends, I wouldn't want to slay Telemachus. It's reprehensible to kill someone of royal blood. But first, let's ask the gods for their advice. If Grace's oracles approve the act, I myself will kill them and tell all other men to do so too. But if the gods decline, I say we stop. And Phinehas finished. They agreed with what he said. So they immediately got up and went away to Odysseus' house. Once they reached the palace, they sat down in the polished chairs in the great hall. At evening, the fine swineherd came to Odysseus and to his son, busy getting dinner ready. They killed a boar, one year old. Then Athena approached Odysseus, Laertes' son, and touched him with her wand and made him an old man once again. She put shabby clothes around his body just in case a swineherd, by looking up, would recognize him and then go off to tell faithless Penelope and thus failed to keep the secret in his heart. 